Hi, everyone, and welcome to our third annual Autism Hope Summit. Gosh, we have a real treat for you. We have Julie Matthews, and if you don't know who Julie Matthews is, then I don't know where you've been in the autism community. She is amazing. I have known her for, gosh, I over a decade at least. Mm -hmm. uh, and today we're going to be talking about nourishing hope for autism using food and nutrition to improve autism. This is a huge topic for me. I, I, I really believe food is either medicine or poison to children. So I think this is going to be a great conversation today. Before we get started, Julie, obviously I know your background. Um, I, I know that many watching know your background. But for those that don't, can we you know, give them a little bit of your background and, and why you're so passionate about what you do? Sure. So I am a certified nutrition consultant and I have been working with kids with autism for 16 years now. Uh, and I guess I'm passionate because I see kids feeling better and that is a really rewarding place to be. Uh, I started doing this after I met a man who had recovered his kids from autism and he really encouraged me that we really needed people to help with food and nutrition and diet and all of those things. And as soon as I saw that nobody really was talking about it, that there was science behind it and kids were suffering and this could help, that was pretty much all I needed. And that's all I've done ever since. And, uh, and it's, it's really an amazing journey. Well, you know, I know that with autism, with one in 68 children, we can't get enough help. We need more of you out there. And so I know your days are just crazy busy, just trying to help as many people as you can. And so today we're talking about using food and nutrition to improve autism. So what does the science say about that and, and how does it help autism symptoms? Sure. Well, I think the reason, firstly, I think it's great that we're starting and talking about the science because it is really solidly based in science. If you think about if you're uh, if you go to med school, which I have not, but or you you're uh, any any sort of the health world, what do you learn? You learn all the biochemical pathways, all of them. But then there's this sort of disconnect between how the nutrients get into those biochemical pathways, and they get there usually by the food that you eat. So that's why I like to tie together what is our biochemistry and the chemistry of the food and how do those things either go well together or not go well together? And how do we figure out who needs what types of diet and who needs what types of supplements and things like that? And so what the science really tells us about autism is it is a, a neurological condition that it has all this underlying biochemistry that uh, is not um, optimal. Uh, it's different for everybody, but usually there's a, the immune system, the digestive system, detoxification are usually some of the main systems that are impaired. And then from there, you can now affect any system in the body. And so, you know, what I'm looking to do is how do we, for example, if the gut is not digesting food well, well, how do we remove the food that inflames the gut? How do we supply food that is going to get digested and then is going to supply the nutrients that we need for the brain? Or how do we get the gut working better so that there aren't pathogens in the gut that are now causing havoc on the biochemistry and all that? So basically, I'm looking at all of those different um, ways that children with autism might have inflammation, um, immune system dysfunction, digestive issues, and, and what have you, and figuring out what foods might be causing them reactions that don't cause other people reactions and how can we remove foods that we need to and then add nourishing foods so that we get the right balance for that person. Now, it's fascinating to me that, you know, people still aren't the very first thing when they get autism, like, or not get it, but you know what I'm trying to say, when they're first diagnosed, when their child's first diagnosed. I would think that my son was diagnosed 14 years ago. And I would think that 14 years later, we'd be a little bit farther along in the sense of, oh, here's your diagnosis. And by the way, you might want to at least consider a foundational gluten-free, dairy-free diet at the very least. And yet that's not happening. So, no. you know, why aren't parents being told that mm. diet can, you know, help the behaviors and the symptoms mm. of autism? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I don't know if I have a really good answer why people aren't doing that, because the science is out there, like, you know, like we're talking about. Um, I think there's a little of a disconnect. I think that when you go get an autism diagnosis, usually it's by somebody that's looking at certain behaviors and characteristics and 
psychological characteristics and they're describing it in that sort of a way. So when you go into that doctor and then you say, oh, but they also have diarrhea, it just doesn't fit into their model. They study the brain, somebody else studies the gut, somebody else studies something else. I firstly don't think they realize in some cases that it's a whole body disorder where all of these other symptoms that they have could be affecting the brain. And if they don't realize that there's something underlying what's going on in the brain, then they're not gonna see food as a helpful solution to that. I mean, that's, that's what I think is going on. Um, but we know that the opposite is true, right? We know that these systems are affected. We know that food makes a difference and we know that they can get better um, in a, a wide range of degrees of betterment, right? Um, some cases it's small step-by-step -step improvement. Sometimes it's just not suffering with digestive pain, which you know what is a huge quality of life issue. And that's, if that was improved and that alone was improved, that would be amazing. But um, a lot of times we start working on this underlying system and we see behaviors improve and uh, mood improve and connect connectivity and connection and social socialization with others improve as well. Um, language, all sorts of types of things can improve when we get at the root cause of the health issues or the physiological issues that are causing the brain issues. Mm -hmm. And what is the first steps of, you know, let's say a family wants to start the diet, you know, what What's the first steps that somebody can make even trying to Im implement this into their child's life? Sure. Well, you know, again, it depends where they're starting, but let's just say they're starting at the very beginning and uh, maybe they haven't even heard before that diet matters uh, for any for anything. They right? don't know what gluten is, though, because I know that even though in our world it seems so, like, of course, I've been places recently where people will say, oh, that's that ho Hollywood diet, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a popular fad diet for all the cool people. But in some ways, it's great because there's more options for foods out there because 14 years ago, you know, and yes. I know that we were in our kitchen trying to grow stuff. Yes. <laughs> and, stuff and, and now it's so much easier to be able to access stuff that we never could before. So that's the great part of it. However, yes. you know, what, how do we even just start at the beginning? Maybe we should even start where, what's the first diet that you actually recommend if you have one, if somebody's just starting out? Yeah, I would even take it one step even before that and say, well, what would be just the first step someone could do in whatever their diet happens to be? And I'd say the easiest, probably one of the most impactful things is just to get out the artificial additives. It's easy. You don't have to change, radically change anything. I mean, you know, let take my nutrition hat off for a second and say, you can find cookies and candy and anything you want. At least it's free of artificial red dye and blue dye and artificial colors and preservatives and all of those things that really, really are hard on uh, the detoxification system as well as the neurological system and all sorts of things. I mean, we know that neurotypical kids that get fed artificial additives in their food get hyperactivity. I mean, if that can happen just to anybody, um, when your systems are a little bit more impaired than that, you could have quite severe uh, aggression from that or um, irritability or a headache or whatever it might be. Um, so getting out the artificial stuff is something that everybody can do because you can choose an additive-free uh, waffle or chicken nugget or, you know, we can talk about man to make it healthier and stuff as we go here too, but at least it's a step that anybody could take that really make, can make a huge difference because these additives really are tough on the body and very reactive in terms of creating behaviors and things for all, all kids, really, or yeah. most, many kids. So let's say that families have already done that and they're, you know, they're, they're looking, they're seeking, they're saying, okay, I want more. I'm learning that these families are talking about, um, you know, as we, as we know, we talk often about gluten-free, dairy-free. Do you, mm -hmm. you recommend starting with one? Do you recommend starting with both? Do you recommend starting above that? What is your recommendation? Mm -hmm. And they are looking to take that next kind of bigger step. Right, right. Um, you know, gl the gluten-free and casein-free diet has a lot of great research. Uh, and, and it's one of the diets where you see the most people online talking about wonderful results. Uh, because it's often the first diet that we try and it's been around for a long time. And um, so that's what I would say gluten-free and casein-free diet is probably the most 
common special diet that we uh, people will usually go to. Um, you know, everybody's different with where they are and how challenging or not challenging that diet might be. So there's always support for people if they want to change their diet and they find that to be a challenge. The thing about gluten and casein is that they can, when they're not broken down properly, those proteins can leak into the bloodstream from an inflamed gut that's not breaking down the food. And those long protein chains that aren't supposed to be there actually mimic opioid compounds and fit in the opiate receptor. So that means that they mimic heroin, morphine. You know, they're very addictive chemical compounds and they're very addictive foods. So you will very frequently see kids with autism eating only chicken nuggets, pizza, milk, cheese, you know, those kinds of things, all of those wheat and dairy based foods. Um, and part of that may be because they are more, um, uh, they've got this chemical message in their brain telling them that they should eat more of that. Um, so that, so from that perspective, also it can be very inflammatory, uh, can be very difficult on the gut. It can cause problems with digestion that can exacerbate anything. Uh, there's so many potential challenges associated. Some people have autoimmune reactions. Some people have food sensitivities to them. Some people have um, cerebral folate uh, deficiency and um, antibodies to folate receptor and all sorts of reasons why this particular diet works pretty well for a lot of people. Um, in terms of how to implement this diet, that's where you know, everybody's going to be a little bit different. So some, I often like to suggest doing one food before the other. So for people that are really new, gluten is the protein that's in wheat and rye, barley, spelt, kamut, uh, as well as commercial oats. So you can find gluten-free oats. Um, and casein, one of the proteins in dairy. And um, just for our conversation here, basically any animal milk of any kind, although we can talk about other distinctions. Um, taking those out uh, usually I'll take out one of those categories at a time, either gluten or casein first. Um, and that's usually because two things. One is sometimes it's easier just to start with one thing, but also I like it because then you can see if you notice any changes. So if you implement, anytime you implement two things at once, which is a fine strategy, but you know, if you implement two things at once and you see a benefit, you don't really know which one gave you the benefit. So if you do one at a time, you can kind of see a little bit more of you take out dairy and you see a huge benefit and then you take out gluten, you see a little bit more, you know, you might have a sense that it was more of the dairy. Um, you know, so it kind of gives you some clues for now and for later if you have an opportunity to do it one at a time. And like I said, for some people, it's easier to just change one thing. Now for some kids though, they don't like change and it's easier just to, if you're gonna make a change, just make one change and change everything in that one change. Um, and maybe it changes uh, so it, it kind of just depends. It's really pros and cons. I'm not really a fan of the cold turkey method, take it all out overnight, because it can cause discomfort. Just like if you were going to give up coffee all in one day, you know, you might get a headache or some other things. And if you removed it more slowly, your body would maybe be able to adjust a little bit easier. So I personally like some sort of a little bit of a transition over a little bit of time, um, whether that's... Uh, uh, you know, one meal a day or one, you know, one of those two food groups or one of those two foods, um, proteins um, at a time. But that's often the way that um, works well for parents. And now let's talk about this nourishing hope. Like how would somebody get started, nourish, you know, started nourishing hope? Right? Yeah. It's right. Like well, work, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, my book is called Nourishing Hope. My organization is called Nourishing Hope because to me, um, nourishing hope is a process. I mean, I don't know about you, but even for myself, just living on this planet, we all have certain health things that certain areas we need to boost up and certain areas we need to work on. So we're kind of always to some extent kind of working on how can I get more nutrients in my diet? How can I take out the things that aren't working for me? And those things do shift some over time. So to me, nourishing hope means, uh, putting a focus on being strategic about the food and nutrients that you consume um, and uh, doing so nourishes not only your body, but nourishes parents hope in the possibility that their kids can get better. And um, so that's kind of how I see nourishing hope is, um, is uh, 
almost like an identity. It's a process that people engage in. And um, I just feel like it's a really nice way to see diet as not all or nothing, not you did it right or you did it wrong, but just an ongoing thing. And if you want to start with artificial additives, great. And if you want to start with the GFCF diet, some people will do that. And, you know, it can evolve as time goes on. So it can be doable both for the child and for the parents, because as we know, probably the worst thing for our health is stress. So if we are creating so much stress about getting this diet perfect, honestly, I think that that can do almost as much harm. So I'm always looking at how can, how can I support my clients or families to move towards a healthier diet in a manner that works for them? No, I think that's great advice. Now let's go back to the gluten-free, casein-free diet. But you know, and it could be, and guys, anybody who's watching, it could be any type of diet you're trying to implement. I think mm -hmm. especially, it definitely relates to that. Um, how do we, especially those picky eaters, right? How are we going to swap this food? Because I remember back in the day with Jackson, <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Like he had his particular chicken nuggets. Like that's what he had to have. I guess yes. my son was on the traditional, what I call the traditional, the traditional diet that a lot of children we see on the spectrum somehow and I don't care if you're in London or if you're in Kansas or you're in California, <laughs> somehow they don't talk, but they're all eating the same foods. Right. Nuggets, cookies, waffles, crackers, um, gallons of milk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, it seemed to be, oh, and French fries. That was another mm -hmm. big one. Mm -hmm. um, and not to say any of those foods are good or bad, I think in moderation, however, sure. when we took away the gluten and the dairy, it was like really like watching somebody go off drugs. And we mm. didn't. Back then, too, this was 14 years ago. Back then, the recommendation was take it all away right now. Like, right. You know, like, what are you doing? You must take. And I remember yes. like, you know, opening the cupboards. Like, right. I don't even know how much food we threw away. And I'm yes. Like, I didn't even know what gluten was. I didn't understand what, I mean, I knew what dairy was, but I didn't even know how many foods had these things in it. Um, yes. It blew my mind away. Yes. So that mom, and I don't care how old the child is, it could be two, the child could be 52. Yes. Do we say, okay, yes, I'm getting it. I know food's so important. I feel so guilty every time I do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. We take that and say, these are some tips on how to kind of make it a more smoother transition. Yeah, absolutely. So what I like to do is I like to make a list of breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks and what they eat right now. And you can circle all the ones that are gluten and casein free. Bananas, apples, rice, beans, whatever those things are, circle all the ones that they eat in their diet right now that are acceptable on the list and then start figuring out if you can make any transitions like a gluten-free chicken nugget for their regular chicken nugget, a gluten-free waffle for their regular waffle, and then try out some of those individual products and brands. Sometimes I'll do this homework or suggest my clients do this homework before they even do the diet. So they like one day they throw in the new waffle and maybe they'll try three different waffle brands until they find the one they know their child will eat so that when they do flip the switch, they know they've, they're confident and their child is familiar with it that they know that they are going to be able to be more successful when they do that. So those are some things. Um, what else can people do? Um, I mean, it depends how young your kid is too. So for little ones, sometimes you can like uh, blend things. So like you can take the milk container and you can take your new non-dairy milk and you can little by little add more non-dairy milk to the milk and then eventually it becomes 100% non-dairy milk and it's in that container that they think is milk. Now that doesn't work for older kids typically and it doesn't always work for really super um, picky eaters in that you don't want to ever lose trust with your child and what you're feeding them. So sometimes we can be a little sneaky and the um, child doesn't know. Like if I put um, uh, pureed vegetables in my kids' meatballs, she does not notice and she doesn't care. If I probably said, hey, I'm going to put some vegetables in your meatballs, she probably wouldn't be thrilled about it. But I know her well enough to know that if I just toss it in there, she's not going to know. She's not going to care. She's going to get more veggies. But there are kids out there because she's not really a particular picky eater. If I had a picky eater, I would likely avoid doing that. Um, because if they only have three foods and now you sneak vegetables into one of their favorite foods, 
or now you, you know, change out, I don't know, the flour that's in there or something, um, you might not now get a rejection of that food. And when you only have a few foods, that can be tricky. So it depends. It really knows, it really, it really takes knowing your child um, and what's going to work for them um, and for you, and then figuring out what strategy that you want to employ that's going to be the most helpful. I would say that those are some of the tips that I would do to make a transition. Um, one of the things I really like to do is to test things out before you give it to them. So <laughs> that's a good idea. Some of the stuff doesn't taste so great. It's not. And if you give it to them and they're going, what's up with you, mom? Are you crazy? Then again, they lose a little bit of that. Like, I don't know if I'm going to be, I'm going to be a little suspicious of the next food because I don't know if your <laughs> judgment's so good, <laughs> you know? So um, doing that ahead of time. So one of the things like gluten-free pasta is super mushy if you overcook it for a second. So uh, what I do and recommend for people is to try out the different pastas ahead of time and taste things before you serve them. Because, you know, I've had times where people are like, I would never eat that. Well, if you would never eat it, you might not, I mean, you're, you know, your child might have different tastes and therefore they might love it. But, but if you really don't think that it's appetizing, you might decide to try another brand instead of going forward on that one. And I think that that really does help because then you really set your stage. You really have more confidence in what you're doing. Um, and you're really able to, uh, make the transition more smoothly for everybody. Absolutely. Now I know that there's many more choices out there than just gluten-free and dairy-free. And, um, you know, how do families know, first of all, what choices make sense? And number two, where do I even begin? And how do I even know what to follow? I mean, I know when I go um, on Google sometimes, <laughs> and not to do with diet, but just other things I'm trying to learn about, I'm like, where do I even start? This is so confusing. And there's like 1900 pages. Like I can't, right. like, you know, so I get to like the first five and I'm like, okay, maybe. And then I kind of give up because I'm like, I'll just have to talk to somebody because this is, just, I don't even know where to start. Right. So that's what's happening to a lot of these families. Yes. That they're getting overwhelmed. They don't really understand. There's really no cliff notes. It doesn't seem to be out there or there are really, but they don't know which cliff notes to trust. Right. So, um, you know, where do they start and, and, and you know, how do they know what choices make sense? Yeah, sure. I guess this is probably my favorite question because um, I guess this is what sort of sets, sets me apart as a, a practitioner, a nutrition practitioner. Is I'm always, I, I, for whatever reason, my personality, I suppose, I was always looking for um, which diet helped which person because it, starting this as many years ago, um, there's always a new diet, you know, it started out with GFCF and then, you know, SCD came along and then this came along, no, fail, you know, whatever, fine goal, fail, say, da, da, da. they all came along and then there's always someone that's going to come into your practice and go, wow, this diet was amazing. This is what I needed. My life would not be the same without it. And then someone else comes in and goes, gosh, this diet was really problematic for my child and this was disastrous. So I was, my whole thing was, like, how do I figure out who does well with what diet? So um, I created a process called, uh, or um, what do I want to call it, a methodology called bioindividual nutrition, which is just looking at our biochemical individuality and figuring out what foods work for that person and what foods don't work for that person in order to choose the right diet. And the way I do that is I'm looking at a combination of what symptoms they have, because there are common symptoms of certain, I mean, certain symptoms you could have a reaction to any of the foods, but there are some, some things like um, phenols and salicylates, for example, very common to have red cheeks, red ears, hyperactivity, uh, sleeping challenges, um, maybe irritability or some aggressive behavior. Those are pretty common. I see those all the time. And when I hear those symptoms, well, that's one of the first suspects that I have. So I'm looking at symptoms and I can combine that with lab results or maybe what the doctor's diagnosis is or something about, you know, some GI um, uh, condition or something <clears throat> and use that to figure out which diet for which person. So I guess the way how a parent might do it is they might look at um, what, what, um, symptoms are common with which foods? What symptoms does, does my child have? What foods do they eat a lot of? Um, what do I know is not functioning so well on a biochemical level? If you know that, you may not. Um, and what does that tell me about what direction? So for example, if someone had those symptoms, um, I'd probably be looking at things like um, 
apples and grapes and berries and spices and almonds and honey. Now, these are all really wonderful phytonutrient rich foods. They are good for us. Um, but if we have a biochemistry that is not supportive of that, they can create all of these very significant symptoms that I just mentioned. Um, I had one client, his aggression was quite severe. And just taking out the, certain fruits and certain vegetables and certain things, the aggression went away. So if you can get the right diet for the right person and address whatever that biochemical issue is, that can really make a big difference in helping that person. So you don't have to have an overly restrictive diet because we obviously can't take out everything and we don't want to take out those foods if we can handle them because we all know how you know wonderful berries are and herbs and spices and things like that. Um, it's when we can't handle them that there's an issue. So how would we figure this out? I would be looking at a number of things like is someone dealing with a gut issue? There are certain diets that really support good gut healing. So um, maybe it's uh, grain-free diets or grain and starch-free diets, maybe something like a specific carbohydrate diet or a GAPS diet, or paleo diet. Um, <clears throat> maybe it's somebody um, with yeast overgrowth or something. We want to look at like a body ecology diet or something. We're going to get a lot of fermented foods in there. Um, but then those fermented foods may not work so well with somebody with some other issue. You know, so again, I guess what it'd be is um, trusting your instinct and your observations along, you know, with other things, because you might hear, oh, this diet's the greatest diet in the world, but then you try it for your child and it doesn't go well. And then the sort of sad thing I sometimes see online in some of these groups is like, oh, well, you're just not doing the diet hard enough. Do it more strict. Do it. And a poor thing is like, you know, not getting better, is getting going in the wrong direction. So that's why, you know, I say really, um, observe things and see for yourself what which direction do you think is the right direction to go everyone else might be telling you this supplement or these types of foods are the best things or the worst things but your child is gonna be your best uh, mirror as to whether those foods work or don't work for that person what I was gonna say is it made me giggle because you know when you're saying those moms are saying you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> My answer to each and every one of you moms, and I'm a mom with a child special needs, so I can absolutely say this is you can come over to my house then and you can be with my child while that's happening if you think I'm not doing quote unquote the best that, right. that you could do because uh, I'm telling you every child is different and yeah. I, I see the same kind of threads like oh we well, didn't do this or you did, and they're so judgmental <laughs> yes exactly I have to say guys we cannot be judging each other we're trying to do our best and then I joke often you know and I say this often when you're pregnant and what to expect when you're expecting nowhere does it say by the way you might have a child with autism. Oh, and, and by the way, you might have to be on a special diet and this, that, and the other. So, guys, we're just doing our best. So, I instead of like judging the family, and yes. by the way, that's I see that a lot. Yes. Um, support that mom. Exactly. Lift up and say, oh my gosh, you're a rock star. You're totally trying because yes. you know what? She might not have taken a shower. She <laughs> might not have that day who knows when she's about to wash her hair and she's probably been crying because i know that was me i just totally described me being my, my journey of diets in the beginning um and you know it's you know we're just doing our best so guys yeah, yeah if you if you want to say that then your job is yeah if you have the you know this is what you did wrong then the solution is <laughs> you come over and you fix it yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's just my my opinion yeah. I hear you. I mean, we certainly should not be judging others. And there are those diet people that sometimes they're so passionate about their diet that um, they think the stricter, the better. So they, the, the mom might be following the diet 100%, but she could be stricter, you know, so all of and and, and stricter might be worse, right? So um, yeah, so I'm just think, um, it's not always that you need to do the diet harder, you might need a different diet. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I want to talk a little bit about, because um, this is very exciting, that just recently happened in your life. Um, and I know, you, I want to say, was it five years? Is that how many Yes. Um, that you were part of this team doing this amazing research. And so I'll just like hand it over to you. I would love for you to kind of share what this exciting news was. I know I personally have shared uh, the, the paper with our partners at Autism Hope Alliance, which we have nearly a hundred. Um, and so we want people to understand how important food is. And yes. so I love, love, love um, 
what just happened really awesome for your, the work that you did. So I'd love for you to kind of share that. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, on um, in the journal called Nutrients on uh, March 17th of 2018, um, this study that was led by Jim Adams, uh, Dr. James Adams is an amazing researcher who's published several dozen studies and um, he asked if I would be part of a piece of the study. And so we looked at six nutritional treatments. Um, uh, let's see. It was, it's called comprehensive digest, uh, comprehensive, uh, dietary and nutritional intervention for autism. And it was over the course of a year. So it was a long-term study with six different interventions, more or less one a month. Um, and then following it for the rest. It was, it was a little skewed slightly differently than that. But the point was that staged over some time. Um, and the treatment group had, of uh, uh, almost seven point increase in IQ. Wow. Um, and they had four and a half times the developmental age increase over the non-treatment group. So instead of four months of uh, development, they had 18 months of development in a one year period. So it was really, really exciting. Uh, I, I, I happened to be on the diet portion. So it was looking at a multivitamin mineral formula, fish oil, digestive enzymes, carnitine, Epsom salt baths, and a healthy gluten-free, casein-free, and soy-free diet. And so uh, myself, along with my colleague, Dana Lake, we put together the uh, educational presentation and the one-on-one -on -one consults to help the parents implement the diet portion of it. So that was my contribution to the project. And uh, yeah, it took a long, you know, these things take a while. So from conception to publishing, um, I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. So yeah, we're really excited. And, well, and what's really nice is that, especially for the families that have been doing some form of diet, right? And we, you know, it's not as bad as it used to be, but I remember early days, people would look at you like you were cuckoo. They were like, what's wrong with you? What do you mean? No, 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 they poo-poo the diet. Now, it's not so much like I feel like people might say, especially depending on where you live, right? So I'm in Southern California, but I think it might be different in the Midwest depending on what, you know, because I've been to certain areas in Nebraska and they looked at me like I was crazy <laughs> when I was talking about gluten-free, dairy-free and just like trying to explain why. You right. know? Uh, so I really do think it's, you know, where you're at in the world. Um, but, you know, it's so wonderful, just so wonderful to have a published study of things that clearly our group has known for quite some time. Yes. But what's so wonderful is that, you know, new parents coming in that might have a, like, hmm, I heard from someone I shouldn't maybe, that doesn't mean anything. Why should right. I even bother, right? Uh, or even for older families that have been around for a while that go, you know, I, I did try diets kind of back in the day and I didn't really do anything. And, right. I feel like it's a big eye opener because I think you and I have the same philosophy, as I said earlier, is that food is either medicine or poison mm. for our children. And you know, it's what it's really what we put in our bodies has that direct effect on how our kids are feeling and behaving and acting and and this this published study that you were so like how amazing and what an honor to be part of, right? Yes. yes. Like I just, and I feel like it's a long time coming because I mean, I can't even tell you when just uh, the companies that we talk to to potentially partner with Autism Hope Alliance, we're very picky on the partners we choose. And it's fascinating because they'll say, well, why, why do we have to only be gluten-free, dairy-free? Because that's like our basic foundational right. part. And I'm like, no, it's just super important for these kids. But there's no study on that. I hear that <sighs> all the time. I hear that all the time. Yeah, there's no study on that. Or didn't they poo-poo that? Like, right, just, right. You know? and, and the thing is that before this study, there were already many studies. So this is not actually the first study. It's a great study because it's a long-term study. There aren't many of those. And the other cool thing is it's a – um, looking at supplements and diet at the same time, which is really more how realistically families are going to do something. They're not going to implement one thing and wait a year and implement another thing, you know? So, um, yeah, so it's it's nice to see the actual result of the way that families would ap um, actually likely implement changes in a, uh, you know, a, a multi, uh, um, what do I say, factorial approach, you know? 
Maltaia. About the study though is there hasn't been one for a while and yeah. and obviously there's other people that will say well no that study was like already debunked by this study so i honestly feel like with studies and i know a lot of people feel this way i can't be the only one where it's like okay so our study comes out okay hold on wait let me go get another one you know and it's like we're constantly trying to like do this and i can't understand we're talking about food people like <laughs> that's right. something that's like so like mind-boggling it's like we're talking about food and and the very thing, what I'll tell families out there, guys, if there's a 1% chance, and literally a 1% chance that your child can feel better by just taking out, as Julie said, you know, the food colorings or just trying one thing to try to change out, whether it be a dairy or a gluten or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. why would we not try that? Because we're still right. learning so much about autism. We really are. Absolutely. And, and, and the, the parent reports and, and surveys and stuff show that up to 85% of the families say that diet has a benefit for them. So, you know, it's going to be a lot higher than that 1% anyway. You know, there's a lot of really wonderful reasons to yes. try. Congratulations on that. I, Thanks. I that is so great. And we need more people out there, you know, rooting for us, cheering for us, saying, hey, we hear you. We're trying our best over here to, yes. to try to help. So um, I think you've been a great, great supporter, a great cheerleader, a great, you know, a passion driven person in our community saying, hey, I want to make sure that I can help in any which way. I mean, you're definitely truly an advocate for autism. And so I thank think you. that, you know, us in this community are just lucky to have people like you. So thank you for that. Thank um, you. Super excited, guys. Um, so Julie has an awesome free gift to give you guys. It's pretty cool. So she's having, this is brand new, so I'll let you guys know. It's like kind of like a new thing right now. That we're, we're letting you guys know something that most people don't know about yet, right? She's having a new book come out, which is really cool. So, and this new book, why don't you tell the title what the new book is? Sure, it's Using Food and Nutrition to Improve Autism and ADHD. So that is so great because here's the thing, guys. Her, like research her experience like everything around what she does she eat breathes and sleeps this i mean truly <laughs> for somebody that doesn't have a child with autism definitely like goes above and beyond anything i personally have ever seen um, and guess what she's giving you guys she's giving you the first chapter of the book Awesome is that? So thank you. I, I know these people are going to go crazy for it because there's dozens and dozens and dozens of studies so if you need something to show your teacher or your doctor or your aunt or somebody, it's a really nice way to say, no, there is science to why I'm doing this. So please don't give them any infractions or, hey, I'd really like to try to implement this. And someone tries to tell you, oh, there isn't any science. It's just a great place for you to get empowered with understanding what that science is. So you can be empowered with the choice and decisions that you want to make. Well, and I always think of, I think often of like families will say, well, gosh, but my, the, the in-laws, they just won't be supportive of this. What a great gift you guys can give them. I mean, I just think this is the best gift ever. And it's so great. It's like, oh, hold on, I got you something. You must read it. And then like a week later say, oh, by the way, here is Johnny's cookies. Here is Johnny's chicken nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> and almost make it feel like it's their idea too. Like, oh, can you read this book for me? And maybe give me some advice. I'm super busy, but already read the book first. Right. But like make it be like as though you're trying to get help from them. And then it'll be like their idea. And so everybody will be on board. So I, I love your, um, I love your cookbook. I loved your DVDs. You have such a great resource and like resources on your website. Um, I know all that stuff will be here in uh, the video. So you guys can you know, make sure you guys can follow her and, and get her advice and, and just know where she's going to be. She's all over the world. <laughs> um, and guys, if you really love this, you know, interview and you want to have it forever and you want Julie to be in your like living room every day, like <laughs> easy thing to do. All you have to do is go to autismhopesummit.com. You guys can buy the whole package of Julie and all of our top experts, over 25 of them. And here's the coolest part. Every time you guys buy the package, not only are you going to get to keep it forever, but the dollars that are raised are helping the Autism Hope Alliance with their nutritional scholarship fund. So that means we can help more and more families. So for me, it's a win-win all the way around. And I can't thank you enough, Julie. I know how busy your schedule is. And 
you know, what message do you want to leave with families regarding wherever they are on their journey, beginning, middle, you know, um, for a while, where do you want to leave um, with them with that message? Yeah, I would say it's the, the power of nourishing hope and planting that seed of nourishing hope. You know, it's, it's actually, it's already planted and just nourishing that wherever you are, um, just, uh, just always knowing that there are things that you can do in your very own kitchen. I mean, there's nothing more inherent to us as mothers than nourishing our child on some inherent innate level. And this is something that you can do in your, you know, and you have it, you're empowered at your fingertips to nourish your kids. So just um, want to leave with you the, um, this wonderful opportunity that you have. And um, if I can be of any support or if there's any other families out there that can support you along this journey, uh, we are here for you. Oh, I love that. That's a powerful message. And guys, you just, we have to always say, just don't give up. You know, there's, if you don't know the answer, just keep on looking, ask questions, you know, find people like Julie. And that's what people like Julie are here for. Like this is her life's work. So <laughs> never, never give up. And until next time. Bye guys.